Place marking programmers, it's Prof G. Let's add a place lookup to our Snacktacular app so that we can get the coordinates, the latitude and longitude of any place that we look up. And once we do this, we'll be able to plot locations in a map in our next lesson. Let's look up that big learning. So at the end of our last lesson, we created a standalone app that displayed the user's location coordinates and that allowed us to look up the location of a place, assemble an address, and get its latitude and longitude. Well, in our Snacktacular app, we want to add place lookup functionality when we add a new place. We should be able to press a button that lets us search on a place, then tap the selected place. It should grab the name, address, and coordinates and pass them back so that we can store with any saved spot. Well, actually, this is going to be pretty easy to do, given the hard work that we did in the previous two lessons, and although we can refactor things out to make it even more modular, for now, let's head to our Place Lookup Demo app that we wrote over the past two lessons. I'm going to command click the files that I want, Place, Place View Model, Location Manager, and Page Lookup View. Then, if you start to drag this section, and then Command Accent Mark to bring up the Snacktacular app, you can drop these into the Project Navigator. I'm going to drop them just below Spot Detail View. Now when this box pops up, make sure you have copy items if needed selected. This is going to make sure that we copy each of these files so that you have a new version of these files added to your project. Then click Finish, and those files are now in Snacktacular. I'll arrange my files a bit better. We'll eventually create folders for these different groupings, but for now, I'm going to put place just by spot. Those are both models, and I'll put the location manager and place view manager just below the spot view model, since these are all view models. And I've got all my views already together below this, so now let's make sure that we create an environment object for our location manager. So in the Snacktacular app file, that's the first file that runs in the app, in the struct we'll add at state object var location manager equals location manager open and close parens. Remember, we always initialize our view models once when they're first used using the at state object property wrapper. Then we'll add this to the view hierarchy as an environment object. So below the login view in the window group, we'll say dot environment object passing in location manager. That's the variable that we just declared and initialized with state object above. Now let's take a look at the place file and we see we have a latitude and longitude in here that we get from the place. Place mark. Now, instead of dealing with all this business with place marks in our spot struct, we're just going to save our latitude and longitude as numbers, as doubles, which are the same as SIA location degrees, that type alias that we showed in an earlier lesson. We'll use doubles here. Now, before I make the change to the spot struct, I want to make sure that everything is working correctly. And I'm going to show you this because we are going to encounter a problem when running our code after we make the spot change. And this might otherwise be tough to diagnose, so this is definitely one of those problems that I want us to deliberately commit together in our lesson so that we can take a look at the cause and uncover a solution in case you encounter this on your own, and you probably will. It's a pretty common problem to encounter as you're building apps. So I'm going to build and run. Oh, and I'm also noticing that I'm getting a warning in here that we don't use the result of the add document call. I actually forgot. Add document actually does return a value. I had forgotten completely about this. If we look at this in the spot view model, and I'll just ignore the simulator for a second. Watch what happens if I delete and retype add document. Code completion tells us that this returns a document reference type. Now we actually don't need that document reference value. We can totally ignore it, which is why I've ignored it. But if we wanna get rid of this warning that we have in here, we can silence the error. First, let's undo to make sure that we've got add document in here, and we'll just put an underscore equals in front of this add document line. No problem, it wasn't vital to do that, but it's nice to silence any warnings if they come up. Sorry, I didn't catch that earlier. Now, let's stop and build and run again. And I want to point out that we can see the various spots in our spot collection in this list of spots. This is in our list view. And if you head over to the browser and look in your Firebase console under the Cloud Firestore and Data tab, you'll see these same documents in spots, one for each spot that's showing in our app. So all is working fine. We have data stored in the cloud and it's displaying in the app. But now we're about to make a change to the spot structure that's gonna be different than the data that's stored in the cloud. So back in our spot file, let's add two properties so that we can keep track of our coordinates. So we'll say var latitude equals 0, 0.0, var longitude equals 0, 0.0. Now here we also need to update our dictionary so that we can save these values to the cloud. Remember the Cloud Firestore saves things with a set document or add document by using a dictionary. So here where we define our dictionary after address, we'll just say comma and then the new key value pair. So that's the string latitude colon, then latitude the variable name, comma the string longitude 
colon, the longitude variable name. So now our dictionary is set up and we don't have to make any changes to our view model since it simply calls this dictionary computed property just before it needs to save data because it needs it in the dictionary format. So we see that our modular code was super easy to make those update changes. We just made them in the model. We didn't need to touch the view model or the view. And that's how a well-architected app should behave when we want to make changes like this. Now there is a catch in the back end with Firestore and we'll see this in just a minute. Now, before I show you this problem, let's add our place lookup and we'll do this at the start of the spot detail view where we want to add a toolbar at the bottom of our place lookup button, then display the place lookup view. Then the user should be able to search the place lookup view and return the selected place back here to the spot detail view. So first we want to add a toolbar at the bottom. That's the bottom bar as opposed to the navigation bar, but we'll still use toolbar modifier and a toolbar item for this. So I'm going to grab the whole toolbar item view that I've got up here. Make sure that you've highlighted the right numbers of curlies, no more, no less copy this, paste it down below the existing toolbar item, and now to get a bottom toolbar, we change the placement parameter to dot bottom bar. Then let's see, why don't we delete the whole button that's inside here, we'll enter a new button with an action and a label, I'll delete the code placeholder inside the action, we'll get to that in a bit, but the label, let's create an image with system name, magnifying glass, one word, all lowercase, and below this a text view with a string, lookup place. Now this is added right in the center of the toolbar and you might think, hmm, I'd like to move this button to the right instead of the center. How do you do that? Well, maybe you can just add a spacer above the button. That's a good guess, but unfortunately it doesn't work. We lose our button entirely. And we can look at the different placement options up here if we press dot in here, but we see that there's no toolbar trailing in the way there's a navigation bar trailing, but we can do this. But what we've got to do is we've got to change the toolbar item to a toolbar item group. Just by putting group after toolbar item, this allows us to add multiple views inside the toolbar item. And once we do that, the spacer up above is recognized, the button pushes to the right, and we get the setup that we want. So we haven't needed this toolbar item group with a navigation bar because we have more precise placement, but if you want to just have a button on the bottom right, use the toolbar item group and add a spacer just before that button. You can also add the button first and a spacer to the left if you want to push things over to the left. Now remember what we want to do when we click on this button. We want to display a full screen sheet of the place lookup view that we created in our earlier lesson we copied over into this project. So to do this, we need to create a bool to control whether we should be displaying the sheet. So up top, we'll say at state private var show place lookup sheet and set this equal to false initially then down in the button action for our lookup place button we'll just add show place lookup sheet dot toggle but we need to add a sheet modifier so we'll do this below the toolbars i'm just going to code fold the toolbar so that i can see where i'm putting this and below this i'm going to say dot sheet selecting the option with is presented and content is presented is a binding value so we start this out with a dollar sign show place lookup sheet that's the value we just created we toggle when we click on that button in the lookup place then we can tab over press return on the content to get the trailing closure format and in here all we need to say is place lookup view View, which will display that entire place lookup view in the sheet. So we don't put a navigation link in here or anything. It'll just show right up in the sheet. Now, when we select this option, we still have returned place in here. And we're actually going to change the place lookup view so that it doesn't use this returned place. Instead, what we want to do is we want to pass in a spot. We want to select a new spot and then pass that newly selected spot back here. So let's head over to the place lookup view so we can make that change. And remember our binding value here. So we're no longer using returned place, which is a place let's change this to lowercase spot colon uppercase spot it's a spot type and so now we can link this spot to the spot detail view we can head back to that spot detail view I'm gonna backspace over the place lookup view and we'll see if this is changed and Xcode hasn't caught up yet but if I shift command K to do a clean build that's why you see the hammer time really quickly I can see that the change I made is now recognized so I can select place lookup view that accepts spot and I can pass in lowercase spot the spot is displayed here Remember, this is a binding variable, so we need to say dollar sign spot. So any change we make to this value that we're passing into place detail view will be reflected back here when we dismiss out of that view. And it's worth saying that since we're just using this on two views, it's totally fine to pass this over as a state value and back as a binding value. We don't need to create objects or a separate environment object for this. This is going to work fine. So now let's head back to the place lookup view. We still got some changes there. 
and we want to make sure that we update the value when the user taps on the particular place that they get back from the search results. That's inside here in the on tap gesture modifier. Now we no longer want to return a place. We're going to update the spot that we passed in here, that binding value. So we'll say spot.name equals place.name, spot.address equals place.address, spot.longitude equals place.longitude. I should have put latitude above this, spot.latitude equals place.latitude. And then I can delete this reference to the return place down here. We don't need that in this app. This error is bogus, it's gonna go away in just a bit, but I do have to update my preview provider. So I'm gonna backspace over my place lookup view. I'm gonna retype this and I'm gonna select the option to pass in the spot. And since this is a binding value, I need to use that dot constant in front, which is not very user friendly, but it's gonna fix the error. So inside of dot constant, it needs a spot. We can just say capital spot open and close parens, which initializes a blank spot to use in the live preview whenever we start from this page. And our preview shows, so we're looking good good problems fixed. Now let's build and run. And I would mentioned we're going to run into a problem and we'll actually see a couple of them. Now we're logged in, but hey, we saw spots listed here just a minute ago and now they're not here. Now I can click to add a spot and look up a place. So this looks like it might work properly, but oh, if we take a look down in the console, we do see an error down here. We see a message that says, the app has attempted to access privacy sensitive data without a usage description. And it tells us what we need, always and when in use description and when in use description. Oh yeah, these are those two info P list values that we entered in the earlier lesson. Remember we need to enter these two values whenever we want to access a device's location. So Xcode is reminding us of this here. Now this is actually not related to the fact that we can't see our spots in here, but we do have to add these two elements to the info P list. So let's do that now. We can click on the blue project file at the top of the project navigator and with targets and info selected in the info tab, we see our different info P list items and we can just click on the little plus circle in the bottom of our last row and we can search for capital P privacy dash capital L location. You can scroll to find that too, but I've typed that in and it displays what I want. I'm going to first select privacy dash location always and when in use usage description. And then over on the right, I'm going to double tap so that I can enter a string in here. This is just the string that shows up in the dialog box that the users presented to get their approval to allow the device's location to be used in the app. So I'm simply going to write in this app requires access to the device's location. And that's totally fine. And we need to enter a string in another info P list value. I'm going to enter the same one. So I'll just highlight and copy this then head back to the little circle with the plus in it, click on that. Then I need to find privacy dash location when in use usage description. And it's really weird because the previous one was location always and when in use description, you'd think you'd just need the one. It's just a bit of a legacy of changes in iOS where we need both of these, but we do need both of these. So make sure that you've got the correct ones. One is privacy location always and when in use description. And the other one is the privacy when in use usage description description. And I'm just going to paste in the same text that I wrote in over to the right. Now, if we build and run, the app still remembers we're logged in, but we've added those two info.plist items and we no longer see the error in the console reminding us that we've got to add those items and the user is now explicitly prompted to give permission for the device's location to be used in this app. If you don't include this in your app, your app will be rejected from the app store and we also wouldn't be able to return the device's location. So I'll click while using app, but back in our app, we don't see any of the spots that we've entered earlier. Hmm. Now, if we look down in our console, we don't say any additional errors. In fact, we logged in correctly. Let's click on plus and look up a place to add a new place. So you can search for your favorite place in here. I'm going to look for Dave's hot chicken in Newton. Now I don't have any additional errors here, but as you enter in the search field, if you do notice error number three or error number four show up in the console, don't worry about those. We'd mentioned in the prior lesson that those sometimes show up if text is entered and the user text doesn't immediately return a result, or if the the user types too quickly. Remember, Apple throttles the return of results. So errors like that are expected and they can be ignored. And when I click on Dave's hot chicken, the code I wrote updates the spot. It passes the bound spot back to the spot detail view. So now I see the name and the proper address in the view. Totally cool. I didn't type that in. I searched for information and I passed it back exactly what we want. So now let's save this. So when I click on save, I get a message in the console confirming the data was added successfully. I don't see any error here, but we don't see any spots in our snack spots list. 
What gives? Well, let's head over to the Firebase console in the browser and take a look at our data. And I can click on the items that were there before, and I see name and address. But when I find Dave's Hot Chicken, that document has the name, address, and the latitude and longitude, which is what we want. So here's the problem. When we access multiple documents using the Firebase query wrapper in our list view, those spots need to have the same structure. And since we made a change to our spot struct, adding two properties for latitude and longitude, the old data no longer matches the current struct in our app, so we don't see anything. Now watch what I can do. So in our browser, in the console here, I can click on the individual documents for the structs, and the ones that don't have the latitude and longitude, I can click on the triple dots over here on the right and select the delete document option. And I'm gonna delete two of them. I have one more to delete, but let's take a look. So before I delete this, I'm gonna go take a look at my app. I see nothing in the app. Then I'm gonna go back over and I'm gonna delete the last Last one, but I'm going to leave Dave's hot chicken in here that does have the latitude and longitude. And now when I look at my app, ho oh, ho, Dave's hot chicken now shows. So the app is no longer breaking because all of the data we want to read in matches the structure that we have in our app. So the Firebase query property wrapper that we used is super easy to use, but unfortunately it doesn't report errors in the way that we've set it up. So we don't see a clear message that, hey, you know, we've got a problem reading in our data. So remember, if you make a change change to your struct, to the data model in your app. You need to recreate your data so that it matches that structure. Otherwise, if you've got inconsistent data in your file, it's not going to show up in your app. And it can be super frustrating because you don't get any clear errors on that. So make sure you sort of tattoo this on your brain that that is a problem that could occur. And one thing that I could have done is I could have simply deleted the entire spots collection and restarted entering my data in from the beginning. But I wanted to show you that if we had one document in here that did did properly match our structure, then that was going to show up okay when there were no more documents to sort of scramble or, or, or pollute the data that we'd expected. Now back in our app, it's also nice that if we click on a spot, we won't allow the user to change the name or the address or to look up and change the place. And that's really important because we don't want anybody to take the reviews from one place and just change the name or address so that they show up on another place. So we've specifically disabled that capability here in this view, the spot detail view. So that's looking cool. So feel free to add more spots if you'd like. I'll add El Pallone. I can see it shows up here in the app perfectly. The data is passed back. I can save, no problems. I can see it's in the cloud. Nice work, Swifter. We've added place lookup in Snacktacular. Coming up next, we're gonna plot these places on a map. Until then, stay Swifty, my friends.